let's sing. Um, let's start with number, I think it's 337. Oh, 337. Re 337, redeemed. Or we could do 338. Let's do 338. Hmm? 338, redeemed. Let's sing number 462, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Number 462. <clears throat> Blessed assurance, 
the next part of our service, I had just a short passage that I wanted to read from the Psalm 42. Psalm 42, the first five verses, I believe. And it says, let's see, let's see how much, it, think about this and think how much of this can you relate to. This is a prayer from David. Oftentimes I find that things that David prayed resonate with things in my, in my heart, and I would say that they do for this one too. Psalm 42, it says, As the deer, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad, glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. Let's pray for his presence this morning and that we will again praise him this morning. Precious Lord in heaven, thank you for being such a gracious father to us. Thank you for bringing us through yet another week, and thank you, Lord, for this Sabbath day. We invite your spirit to come into our worship time. Lord, touch our hearts, renew our minds, and Lord, we praise and we lift up your name and pray that you will be pleased with our worship. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to lift your name on high today. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open your hymnals to our opening hymn, number 245, More About Jesus. 245. stand while we sing our opening hymn.
Good morning, boys and girls. I am so glad to be back home again. I have missed you all. I am going to tell you a story about Priscilla. Priscilla had been fed by uh, her caretakers with a bottle from the time she was just a baby. And she loved people. She didn't like other pigs. She liked people. And she uh, uh, had a, a little playpen on the porch, and that's where she stayed. But she loved to be with people. And you know what? She didn't like to get dirty. Do pigs usually like to get dirty? Oh, yeah, they like to roll in the mud. But Priscilla did not like to get dirty. So one day, Carol and uh, her little boy, had Stanley had gone to the beach. And there's something else that Priscilla liked to do. She loved to swim. Have you ever heard of a pig swimming? Mm -hmm. I haven't. But Priscilla loved to swim. Have you heard of <laughs> so um, so uh, at the beach, Priscilla was out in the water, and she had her little leash on. And Carol was way out in the water holding on to the leash, and Priscilla was swimming and swimming and swimming. Stanley was up on the beach watching Priscilla swim, and he was just laughing at Priscilla and just having such a good time. And, <clears throat> and then uh, little Priscilla, she heard Carol scream, and she knew something was wrong. She looked up, and Stanley had waded into the water. He didn't know how to swim and he had waded into the water all the way up to his waist. And he was laughing and you know, walking towards uh, Priscilla, and all of a sudden, poof, he disappeared in a hole in the water. He disappeared, and there was a lot of commotion. He was trying to get up, and Priscilla was swimming towards him. And uh, Carol had let go of the leash, and he was, uh, so Priscilla was just swimming and swimming as fast as she could. She could actually go faster than Carol because she was smaller and she could go fast. And so she reached little Stanley first and Stanley grabbed a hold of her and just hung on and they both went down into the water over their heads. And then uh, Priscilla fought her way loose and came to the top and uh, she decided that she'd better get away from Stanley just a little way. So when Stanley fought his way up to the top uh, again, he grabbed hold of her leash. And then she swam just as hard as she could and got Stanley to the edge where he could put his feet on land again and saved his life. Isn't that a great story? She was a hero. Little Priscilla was a hero, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you say she was a hero? I would say she is. And that just goes to show you that God can use anybody, anything, to be a hero. Thank you, boys and girls.
Thank you, Bethlehem and Layla. I was sitting there listening and watching, and it occurs to me that I should stop being startled when I realize that a kid after one kid after another is just growing up. I it just it keeps happening, and I keep being startled. I've been startled many times now over many many kids that are not so much kids anymore. Um, I guess that's that's the plan. Makes me sad when they get grown up enough, they start moving on away. But um, all right, I'd like to invite you to open to our scripture this morning, Deuteronomy 32, verses nine and ten. Deuteronomy 32, verses 9 and 10. And it says, But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. We're going to turn the time over to Renee. Thank you for coming back to us, Renee. Good morning. It's always good to see our friends here in Kashmir. We enjoy coming up here whenever we can. If you don't mind, I'd like to open with prayer. Precious Lord, thank you for meeting us here. And I just ask, Lord, that your spirit would give me clarity. Help something of what I share be useful. In Jesus' name, amen. I had a hard time titling this uh, message, and I hope it makes some sense to you. It comes out of a little bit of what my experience has been these last couple of years with the changes that have happened within our family and also with COVID entering our world. But a stroll with God kind of captures a little bit of how I've spent my time. There are times in our lives when um, it can be overwhelming, where there's just a lot going on, um, our schedules bulge with too many choices, and, and maybe our diets plummet from uh, too much stress eating, and, um, and God just can feel very far away because there's just so much going on in our lives. But there are other times, too, when life can feel like it's just plodding along, I'm not talking about nothing going on, because I don't think that really happens in real life. But, um, you know, so there can be a lot going on. But there can be a season when each day feels like the one before. And life can start feeling a little bit mundane. You feel like you're stuck in a routine that is neutralizing your skills, not challenging them. And there can still be that predictable stress from, oh, maybe an angry boss, or maybe you're caring for an ill child or an ill parent. Maybe you have a leaking bank account or a dissolving marriage. It's not stressless times that I'm talking about. There are times in life when the path just seems worn and worn again each day in a seemingly purposeless meander. Every day just feels like more of the same. And yet God states in Jeremiah 29 that he has a plan for us. And it's a plan that prospers us and doesn't harm us. And I take that literally. So if we find ourselves in a space that feels like it's on autopilot, maybe... God has given us that season. Maybe this pause from mental or emotional strain is his opportunity to deepen our spiritual relationship. Repetitive and predictable tasks can be a gift. I mean, 
Have you not ever planned your grocery list while you wiped down the kitchen counters? Have you not ever prayed while you were driving? Have you ever solved a mechanical conundrum while you were doing some other thoughtless task? Repetitive tasks open up mental time and energy. And today I'm going to pick a little bit on Moses. You know, after all the excitement, after all the privilege, after the affluence of being raised in the household of Pharaoh, I have to believe, because I believe Moses was a real person, that he had to have times of just repetitive days during those 40 years he lived in the desert. And yet we know that without all of those experiences in his life, he would not have been the leader that he was. Without the training as an heir of the Pharaoh's household, he would not have been prepared for the management demands of guiding the Israelites beyond the Red Sea, not to mention the military strategy to command the Israelites in numerous battles. Without the formal education that he received, we wouldn't have the first five books of the Bible written out for us. And I think without the years of isolation and discipline and humility, I don't think he would have recognized the voice of God in that burning bush. Nor would he have been bold enough to ask God to reveal his glory to him on the mountaintop. Because that requires an intimacy with God. Those years somehow prepared him for that ultimate role of hurting a hundred thousand or hundreds of thousands of whining Israelites through the wilderness and teaching them who God is, who God was, and who God always would be. All of these seasons in Moses' life prepared him. And God does the same for us. Deuteronomy 32, 9 through 10 declares that the Lord's portion are his people, or we are the Lord's portion. We are the allotment of his inheritance. Moses is praying this prayer in front of the Israelites because now he knows after 40 years of wandering he's not going into the promised land. He's rehearsing for the Israelites the history of how God has watched over them and led them and what he wants for them. He, God, found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness he encircled him he cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye. God took those years of mundane tasks in the desert to draw Moses closer, to prove to Moses what his character, what God's character is, to prove to Moses what his character, what Moses' character should be and could be, to unlearn the errors of pagan Egypt to develop Moses into the leader of his people. Years of having his pride softened, his anger brought under control, his confidence built by experience and hard work, all of those things prepared him to delegate, to intercede, to speak correction, and most importantly, how to hear God's voice. It reminds me of John 10, 4. Jesus is speaking a parable of a good shepherd, and he says when he has brought out his own, he goes out ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. As SDA Christians, we are familiar with the concept of Sabbath, but we haven't always valued rest Time to be quiet and still. Time to enjoy his presence is too often something we tuck into a busy schedule. It's not something we always protect as valuable time. 
And we, we love prayer. But somehow, over the years, we've gotten suspicious of the word meditation. And yet, these two things, rest and meditation, are the benefits of the plodding seasons of our lives. It turns a period of frustration into an intimate stroll with a loving father. Time to think deeply about what his word says. Time to pray deeply about the issues that touch our hearts. If God goes out before us, if he goes with us, then there must be a purpose even for those plotting times, even if we can't see it at the time. There are times when we don't seem to be moving forward. We're not fulfilling a definable purpose. This is one reason, I think, because it relates to me, why empty nest can be a hard transition. The job description you've put the most time and energy into parenting appears to be over or significantly changed. Those beloved young people who in one way or another dictated a large part of your daily schedule for decades now have moved on and we're left with hours of unassigned time. Oh, we do move beyond the identity crisis, and the time does get filled, but it's immensely more satisfying when those priorities are remodeled by God's hand during a quiet season of predictable routine. A season of unchanging routine may be the time that you need to reset your pace, to build patience or boldness, to recognize that your identity isn't in what you do, but whose you are, or to confront the negative thoughts and the patterns that we have that reject the Spirit's refreshment. A season of predictability and repetitive tasks brings an opportunity to free up our minds and energy to shed harmful belief systems and to embrace new disciplines in our lives. It, it becomes an opportunity to get excited about or to plan for what may come next. So here's a few ways that we can use that time. Learn how to pray and pray the prayer of surrender and trust. In her 2019 book, Rhythms of Renewal, Rebecca Lyons wrote, you cannot heal what is hidden, but when you confess something out loud, you bring it into the light where it can be healed. The power of guilt and shame has no hold on you any longer because secrets lose power when they exit the dark. Opportunities to deepen our trust and surrender to a Father who loves us can bring new confidence to our lives. Confession is meant to bring us peace. It's meant to bring a cleansing and a hope into our lives. Psalm 139, 23 and 24 begs, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Times of predictable routine Give opportunity for us to delve into that and to really hear the voice of God. There is a, a song um, my kids had on a CD years ago, and it has always stuck in my head. It, has, it changed how I viewed my relationship with God. It's a, it's a song called Welcome Home by Sean Groves. And in it, he speaks of himself as a house. And he's inviting God into that house. 
He says, come decorate, Lord. Open up the creaking door and walk upon the dusty floor. Scrape away the guilty stains until no sin or shame remain. Spread your love upon the walls and occupy the empty halls until the man I am is faded and no more doors are barricaded. Invite him in and pray and surrender and trust. Number two, try reading a different version of the Bible. There's something to be said for discovering his goodness in familiar passages that use different words to describe God, to describe what he's doing. Enlarge your vocabulary of God's goodness. And then start small and build. In 2003, the British cycling organization hired a new performance director. Dave Brailsford was his name. As James Clear writes in his 2018 book, Atomic Habits, the performance of the professional riders was so bad that top bike manufacturers in Europe would not sell their bikes to them because they were afraid it would hurt their reputation. But Brailsford's theory was, if you broke down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike and improve it by 1%, you will get a significant increase when you put them all together. So they did. They found the perfect seat for each individual rider. They tested the, the suits. They tested the materials that the suits were made of for aerodynamics. They tested massage gels for faster recovery, and they brought in a doctor to teach them how to wash their hands properly so that there would be fewer colds. They painted the inside of their trucks white so they would see every little speck of dust. On and on it went. And in 2008, five years later, at the Beijing Olympic Games, they won an astounding 60% of the gold medals. Four years later, on their home turf in London, the British cycling team set nine Olympic records and seven world records with 1% improvements. Small changes are sustainable. Small changes require less effort. And small changes build a foundation on which we can continue to grow. If I work out with five pound weights, and this is not a scientific experiment, I actually did the weight, but I don't have a scale this small. so. If I worked out with five pound weights and I wanted to apply this to my life, it would be like me working out and adding a spool of thread to my five pound weights. Do you think I would feel the difference? Not a lot. And yet I would be adding weight. I would be adding time. I would be adding money. I would be adding faithfulness. I would be adding patience. Small changes are sustainable. Our son Jacob, our youngest, ran his first marathon in October in Hood River. I've been fascinated hearing his process that he's been on the, the weeks and the months, really, prior to the race. And I've never been a runner, short or long distance. Um, so this was all foreign territory for me. So it was interesting to ask him what he was doing. And he found a training regimen online and, and uh, followed it carefully. And he accomplished his goal of running 26.4 miles 
and he even bested his hoped for time. But here's what's fascinated me. There was a gradual start. His training program had an emphasis on rest and recovery. He never actually ran 26.4 miles in training. The closest he got was 22 miles. He only did it once, and it was weeks before the race. He alternated shorter runs with faster runs, longer runs with days off, flat runs with runs that climbed hills, and others that descended hills. He gradually built his endurance, his muscle strength. He learned his pace. He learned how to breathe properly, and he learned the discipline to keep calm regardless of the conditions. In essence, Jacob didn't train for a marathon. He trained to be a runner. Seasons of predictable routines can be opportunities to develop new habits, to add on to existing ones, to start small and build. Number four, maybe you rediscover your love for what you're doing while plodding along. It could be that there just needs to be a little shift. Moses thought he was leading the Israelites to the promised land. That's what God told him to do. And he was leading the Israelites to the promised land. It just took a 39-year detour. An important detour of mentoring and teaching and correcting and undoing the slave mentality of the Egypt years. So maybe, maybe it's time for a shift. Maybe it's time for a pivot. We don't parent our 13-year-old the way we parent our three-year-old. And yet you're still parenting, right? You see what I'm saying? It, you could be doing exactly what you need to be doing, but there needs to be a slight shift. It's possible to be ex exactly in the place God wants you to be and just not see the long game. Ask God, what is he doing in your life? Is there something that just needs a little tweak? And the last one, it could be that it's time for a pivot altogether. It could be the angst and the boredom is a symptom of a readiness for a complete change. A time to, to go to school, to start a business, to change jobs, to make friends outside of your normal circle. Volunteer for a cause. Just time that little nudge that he's asking you to make a change. So these pauses, these pauses in our lives can be an opportunity for us to deepen our prayer life of surrender and trust. It can be an opportunity to, to study a little bit differently, to try a new version, to try a new author, to try something new. It can be just the period of time you need to start something small and build to rediscover the love of what you're doing or to pivot all together. It reminds me of Hebrews 12. The author has just gone through this whole list of these people who are the pillars of our faith. And he says, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Maybe the pace of your race has slowed a little bit, 
that that's okay. This could be valuable time. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We don't want to grow weary and lose heart. I think the chances are pretty good we won't have the notoriety of Moses. But don't lose sight of the fact that God knit you together just as you are in this culture, in this family, in this period of time, in this church. Run your race. And when the pace slows, stroll with your father. This time has purpose, just as it did for Moses, just as it did for the British cycling team, just as it did for Jacob, even when it seems slow or routine, predictable, mundane. God knew you would have this season. He has something for you in it because you are the Lord's portion. He encircles you, he cares for you, and he guards you as the apple of his eye. Let's sing. Father, our glorious Lord, help us to remember that we are not ever out of your reach. 
that whatever season we are in in our lives, you are here with us, that you are going out before us. And what we want, Lord, is to know your voice. We want to be able to travel forward at whatever speed it needs to be, knowing that we're following your will. I ask your blessing, Lord, on this church family, on those who are searching, on those who are grieving, on those who are learning. Thank you, Lord, that you come alongside that you are there for each and every one of us. May our walk be one that brings us closer together. In Jesus' name, amen.